Okay, so um, this is a test here today, and I have a little setup here. So um, some of my students have been trying these white flowers out, uh, which is a great challenge, especially in watercolor. Um, so much of what needs to be done needs to be done using negative space and the background to define the positive space. So you really have to look at what's around the flower and the structure of the flower because very few marks need to give you the illusion of what's happening in the petals. And even though it's a white flower, um, you're going to have to paint it using color, right? Because you can't paint using white. <laughs> At least not in watercolor, we use our water as our whites. Um, and we save out our whites on our paper. Um, so I have my image on an iPad, and then I'm all set up over here. I'm outside today, it's nap time. Um, and so I have my paints, and my brushes, and I have all my pens and things, and my water. And uh, we're just gonna see if we can do two quick renditions of this flower. So one I'm going to do, I'm going to draw using a pencil first and then I think right by its side or maybe I'll even flip my paper over. I think that's probably what I'll do. So I'll do one flower here and I'll um, work with that pencil first and then over here on this side I'll do this one um, and I'll just flip and, and work using just watercolor um, because sometimes I don't like the way that the pencil looks underneath the watercolor. I'm using um, really good watercolor paper. This is 300 pound uh, cold press arches paper that I bought in um, a pack, right? It all comes together as one solid pad. I can't think of what that's called at this moment. That's silly that I can't think of that. A block. I bought a block of watercolor paper. Um, and there's like 10 sheets to a block and they're glued on the sides so you don't need to tape down and they're really great for working outside. And then um, I am using a combination of paints. So right now I've got a bunch of paints um, that are all different kinds of brands. Uh, I have some Holbein, I have some uh, Utrecht, I have some Windsor & Newton, um, and they're just kind of all mixed in there depending on what colors I needed. You know, I know that I have a Windsor & Newton Indigo, um, and that I have a Windsor & Newton Opera Pink, but almost everything else is either Holbein or Utrecht. So that's my paint situation right now. And then back to this gardenia. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at just the center of this flower and I'm gonna make just really light marks. I'm working with an H, uh, which is sort of right in the middle, right next to an HB. And on your uh, graphite, you don't wanna work with anything too soft when you're working in watercolor because it'll transfer, right? Because when you're laying down those small bits of graphite, especially over a paper that's so textured as a cold press uh, like this is, you're going to get quite a bit of graphite that sits on the top. And then you don't want to work with a graphite that's too hard, like a 4H or a 6H. I wouldn't even use a 2H probably because then you're going to scar your paper because all of our paper is 100% cotton when we're working um, with good paper, especially an arches paper like this. It sounds like I'm doing an ad for them. I am not. I just have found that between them and Fabriano, I get the quality of mark that I like within my paints and I really love that this paper can handle so much water so you can do really wet on wet work and then really like controlled dry work as well um, just to you know have that versatility in a paper I think is is quite important especially within one piece and I do a lot of drawing on my pieces both before and after using all different kind of media 
So um, if you're not doing just strict watercolor work and you're coming back in with ink pen, gel pen, starting it with pencil, starting it with watercolor pencil, the better your paper, the more it can handle. Um, and I just find that, that if I spend my money on my paper, then I actually don't have to spend money anywhere else. So I can work with uh, fairly cheap paints and achieve high quality work on a good paper. So I always try to encourage my students to spend their money if they're going to spend their money on paper. I want to be real delicate, real light with the mark making system that I'm using here because I want those whites to be defined by small changes in value rather than heavy line work at this moment. I think that's something that's so beautiful about this flower is that it's really delicate and yet you can tell that it's really strong that it has this really nice waxy petal and when I'm drawing I'm always looking for connection points so I have a, a deep history of drawing I've been taking formal drawing classes since I was six years old uh, which gives me about 30 years of drawing under my belt and what I'm doing a lot of the times is I'm doing shape identification and sometimes those shapes are the shapes of two negative spaces coming together or a change in value being defined as a shape um, which can help guide you you know so I'm looking for a connection point here on my petal so here I am here's the petal that I'm looking at I've drawn the center and I've come out onto this petal here and then I'm coming down into this one and then that'll give me I see a fold there right I see one and then two and then three there's kind of this stacking point so when I'm working on my drawing I'm looking at one and then two and then three coming out this way and this third one it's got this great little nick in it and as I come up and over um, I can use that as a as a measuring point as well this flower I believe was photographed in the garden of Barbara Miss Barbara Danielson who is a wonderful watercolor artist in her own right and was married for many many years to a photographer and I feel like she is also a pretty talented photographer in her own right learned quite a bit um, I'm just working up and around I'm almost done I don't want to spend too much more time on this drawing although if you don't mind the look of graphite under your watercolor spending time on your drawing is actually going to assist you right so then the more time you spend on your drawing making it as accurate as you possibly can then you're just dropping in color which is kind of the dream right if you've already done all the hard work uh, in regards to your setup and your composition if you've done all that work with your pencil then once you're mixing your paints and just laying colors in you're kind of in coloring book mode and that's when you can really zone so it's always I'm gonna contradict myself often you know like don't use very much pencil don't spend too much time on your drawing and then I'm also gonna tell you like oh the more time you spend on your drawing and the more accurate you make it the happier you're gonna be um, and that really depends on who you are as an artist where your drawing skills already lie and what you like and are attracted to in a watercolor because there are some amazing watercolorists, especially illustrators who use watercolor that let their pencil work do so much of the composition work and the structure and then they allow their watercolor to just kind of like sing on top of that, you know, just sort of inform these already beautiful marks within 
their pencil work, you know, so that they're getting all that structure in their graphite and then they're just kind of laying in their color over the top of that. For myself, I really love what the watercolor does on its own and what it does that's both in and out of my control. So um, I love observational drawing and, and I like really paying attention to what it is that I am drawing and really looking at shapes and how they move into one another and fall back, you know, looking at those points of intersection. But the thing that I just can't get enough of in watercolor, the thing that brings me so much joy are the marks that I can't make in any other medium, you know. When I started working in watercolor, I realized that there was all of this balance that had to happen, that you had to be both in control and out of control. You know, you had to acknowledge that water is water, and if that's going to be your driving force, that um, every now and again you're going to have to relinquish control, <laughs> um, you know, and I, I always <clears throat> find that I can go pretty deep into this poetic conversation about water is life and it can also kill you, um, you know, so finding that balance between what is the right amount, just enough, the Goldilocks amount, as my dad would say, um, or, you know, too, way too much, you know, this chair might be way, way, way too big for you, or the porridge may be way, way, way too hot for you. <laughs> um, and with watercolor, it's, it's exactly that. You know, it's finding that balance. And I always tell my students, you know, the answer is always water. Uh, if your pigments are oversaturated and you're getting way, 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 way uh, too much color, and, or you've just used way too much water and you're not getting enough, you know, so then you've diluted way too much. So finding that balance between saturation and dilution and just like getting used to how your paints work is so important. I've forgotten a petal out here. Um, so I'm going to drop one more petal in along this edge and it's got this great little almost like tooth shape to it. And then I think I found myself at the edge here. This is this nice turn that I don't want to lose where this petal turns back in and we see like this little bit of white tip um, and then this little tiny bit of shadow underneath it. So I just really want to lock that in for myself so that I'm not losing any of my whites while I'm working. Um, thinking about these petals as having actual structure and being three-dimensional pieces instead of thinking them as like this flat collection is really going to help you because they're not actually flat you know they have this little bit of volume to them and even though they feel two-dimensional in some areas the more that you think of them as these slightly three-dimensional pieces, you know, like you're building a sculpture out of slices of cheese or something. I love cheese. I, most people probably shouldn't be building sculptures out of slices of cheese, but if you think of them as thin slabs instead of as being like actually flat, I think it's really important that you see that they have that, that volume to them. I'm going to go just a little bit darker in some areas so that we can see what the watercolor looks like over the pencil. Um, anytime you're making work, you know, you need to remember that it's not precious and that um, if you don't try it now, you won't figure out what it is going to be like. And if you don't find out what it's going to be like, then how will you ever know that you, when is the right time to use it as a tool? Um, no one is making you create this flower, right? No one's sitting you down and forcing you to draw or paint this flower. You're here uh, by choice, you know, choosing this. And I think if you choose to take some risks, other than the risk you've already taken in, in starting on a piece of paper, um, then 
you'll start to find that your mark vocabulary will grow exponentially and you'll have a much better idea of what your paints can do and what your brush can do and what your pencil can do if you try some things out. So here's a little bit of graphite on our drawing. I'm going to drop in a couple other shadows that I feel like are really important. So I really like this shadow down here. And I am looking at the side of this flower here. The back side of this flower is really important as well. I'm sorry, of this petal. The whole thing is a flower together. Some of your parts there. And these little shadows that are underneath, right, that are created by one petal sitting on top of the other. And then you start to get that depth within the flower itself. So important, so important. Okay, so I've got that. I've got another step in depth here. I'm going to drop that back. You'll note that I'm not using an eraser. The chances of you seeing me use an eraser, especially on a piece of good paper, are slim. I do not want to take any chances damaging my paper. And I've got uh, a really deep-seated... I guess not distrust of erasers, but they should only be used when you absolutely need them. And I always was taught that they are drawing tools themselves, so I shouldn't be fixing mistakes with erasers. I should be drawing with them, um, which is a really difficult challenge. You know, that if you've always thought of your eraser as sort of a, a crutch, and then you're told not to use it, uh, which is what I was told when I was, you know, being trained to draw, basically, is that we only use our erasers to draw with. Um, depending on when you learn that little bit of information and the teacher that you have, it can stay for so long. So it's not necessarily true by any means. Like, I see people use erasers all the time and draw things over and over and over again and make beautiful drawings, but... I think we all know that some of those things that you learn when you're young don't uh, don't go away easily. <laughs> um, so I'm just dropping in a couple more leaves right here and then I'm gonna leave the rest of this structure really open. So here is my photograph that I'm working from on this gardenia. And here is my image and I'm just gonna hold this up for a second. So this is what I've got right now. Um, and I'm working fairly big. You can see next to my hand here, this is a 10 by 14 sheet of paper. Maybe it's even 11 by 16. I'd have to look. Um, and now I'm gonna start with my watercolor. So I'm gonna use what is called a sabolette. I like to use a number six. Um, this is a number six sabolette here. This is from Utrecht. They sell these at Blick. I like them because they're just, they're a workhorse of a brush. Uh, this one's been damaged. I'm not quite sure how this guy, this ferrule, the metal part here, the ferrule has been chinked, which looks like I took a little bite from a pair of pliers or something. But um, when we work in watercolor, like let's say you just picked this as your very first thing to learn in watercolor, which is so, so challenging because uh, painting a white flower <laughs> in a medium in which you don't have white is, is challenging in and of itself. But why not start with the hardest thing? Um, my quick rules are to always think about the white of your paper. That should always be your number one rule. So I'm gonna be really thinking about how to save out my whites. You can use what's called masking fluid. Um, I don't like it. You'll learn more about why I don't like it. The main point of why I don't like it is that it's just another tool that you have to have. And if you lean on it too much, it becomes a crutch. You know, sort of like, would you sit down to draw if you didn't have your eraser? Uh, and if your answer is no, then you're using your eraser as a crutch. And if you won't sit down to do watercolor without your masking fluid, then you're using that as a crutch. Um, so just taking into consideration, like, what can I get done with it? as few materials as possible is, is a really great way to think about making your work, I think. Excuse me, I was just taking a drink. Um, and then the next thing I always think about is my yellows. 
So I, um, I think that if you want to learn names of colors, that that's great. Mm, I don't think you need to know anything other than the temperature of a color, really. So, um, you should always have your primaries, uh, a cold red, a warm red, a cold blue, a warm blue, a cold yellow, and a warm yellow. And if you have that combination of colors, then you're going to be good to go. So, I'm just starting with... Uh, a pretty warm yellow and it's really important to me to think about my colors as never using them straight out of the tube. So with watercolor that's pretty easy because you're always adding a little bit of water, right? So you're always kind of altering them. But beyond that, um, I'm also thinking about changing them just a little bit, you know, and if you start with yellow you get a couple of things done. So number one, yellow is weak as far as colors go. It can be overpowered pretty quickly. Uh, I've mixed in the tiniest bit of violet uh, with my yellow because they are complements. Now you could use a violet that you've mixed. You can use a pre-made violet. Um, just something to set down a little bit of dullness in that yellow so you're altering it just slightly and I'm actually going to work back and forth between those two colors so I'm going to use um, a violet that has a little bit of yellow in it and a yellow that has a little bit of violet in it and together they're going to sort of create this complementary color balance between the two of them um, and I like setting up those complements because they're the best of friends, right? They're opposite each other on the color wheel, and if you have them as your bone structure within your composition, you're just gonna get a lot of like naturally uh, satisfying value changes between the two of them. So right now I'm in the center of my flower and I'm working on mostly dry paper. I haven't gone in and added a big, bit of water you know so I have a lot of control the more water I add the less control I will have and the only thing I will say is if you're working on this flower from the center out you're just gonna want to take baby steps and you're gonna want to think about your mark making system as coming from the center out so right now I'm just laying down a little bit of water over my graphite marks here and I've put down a little bit of yellow in this area. One of the other reasons we start with yellow a lot of the time in my class is that once another color is laid down you can't really come back over it with yellow. You can but you won't get a yellow. So if I've already laid down a blue and I come back over with a yellow I'm going to end up with a green and if I've already laid down a red and I come back over with a yellow I'm going to end up with an orange and we know our basics of color theory here, and the more that you think about them, you know, the better off your paintings will be. Um, I'm just working from the center out here, so I wanna show you like an area here. I've got this really nice white, 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 white bit of petal, and then just a little bit, and I've got that tiny bit of violet and yellow mixed in together. And then I'm just gonna come out. This is a good time to remember that when you work in watercolor, everything dries up. So if I see a shadow on my flower petal, and I would call it one of the darkest shadows, that might be a place in which I strategically drop down my paint to begin with because that'll help me and then I can use it almost like a well to distribute paint out from. Um, and again, I'm just moving either if you want to think about it as all the lines going in towards the center or if you want to think about that like radial symmetry where all the lines are emanating out from the center, it's up to you. Um, and then here, I'm just going to drop a really heavy one because I see this as like a really heavy uh, shadow on there. 
and then under here I've got some really good ones if I take just water on my brush so I've just laid down a little bit of paint and now I'm going to take just water on my brush and kind of pull this color out from there I'm going to get this really nice soft transition and a lot of people work with their paper towel close by or rag or whatever it may be doing a lot of lifting um, I do keep my paper towel close by it's right here next to me and it's funny like here I am talking about all this crutch business right like don't lean on something too much uh, whether it be your eraser or your masking fluid or whatever uh, your your crutch may be <laughs> um, and then I'm telling you I really only have my paper towel to uh, save myself in case of need so if I really drop um, some paint on here in a place that I don't want I hardly ever purposely lift unless I'm making clouds um, and that's that's, that's an interesting thing because I see a lot of people, I see a lot of painters who lift all the time. And if you get good at it, my goodness, you can make some really amazing soft, soft values just by lifting that value. So here, I'll make this too heavy handed and lift it on purpose so that you can see what I'm talking about. So right in here, if I, if I sit, set down a color that's just like, ugh, it's just way too dark. Like, what are you thinking, Corinne? That's supposed to be the white of your paper. And then I take my uh, paper towel and I just set it down and I blot it up, right? And I just lift that color. Oh my gosh, now I have this beautiful light, light value. So if you're somebody who's heavy handed and you find like your paints are not singing in the way that you would like them to, that they're just heavy, that they're sitting too heavy on the paper, you know, you can always add more water right from the beginning, but then another thing you can do is you can go ahead and lay those heavy handed pigments down, right? And then you can lift them up and get these really delicate light, light lights, right? So this is, this is your eraser. Um, and I just don't, I don't want to use it too much, right? That's my own personal um, vendetta against erasers, I guess. I blame... Carolyn Lavender, who was my instructor when I was in high school, um, but I also thank her. <laughs> so these things, you know, they're funny how they stick, especially in art making. Um, and I know some of us have heard some like really staunch rules, maybe even about watercolor, you know, that you would never start on a dry piece of paper like this and that um, you have to get your paper wet before you start. And there's all different kinds of uh, ways in which people were, you know, basically raised with their watercolor. I'm painting something that's not leaf uh, or not petal. And I'm painting a leaf in order to be petal. I don't like that. And now all of a sudden we're doing all these liftings. I don't like how heavy this is. So I'm going to lift that up a little bit. Um, I'm getting some pretty good values here though. And I'm fairly happy with where they're sitting. I can come back in. Uh, I started to say that uh, I love watercolor because it dries up, right? That it's always going to dry lighter than when you set it down. It's very much like washing your hair. You know, when you get out of the shower and you've washed your hair and it's super dark even if you're a blondie blonde, and then as the day goes on and your hair dries, it lightens up. And it's the same thing with watercolor, is we get this really nice overall lightening of our pigments. Um, and so they're always drying up. So here, I'm looking at my piece. So I'm looking at the structure of the gardenia here, and I'm looking at my drawing. And for the most part, I really like where my values are taking me. I see that this needs to be darker in here so that that white really pops. And I almost feel like I want to add, I've only, I've been working strictly with violet and yellow at this point. So just a violet that's got the tiniest bit of yellow in it. And that's what I've been working with throughout here. And maybe I want to take just a little wash into some of these areas, soften up some of those hard edges 
we can lift those up in through there. This guy looks like he's gonna dry way too dark, so we'll pull him up as well. And then I've got this really heavy handed dark over here, but I see it in the piece as well. So maybe I'll leave it. I see these little bits of brown. Um, so I'm gonna take a little bit of red and I have like a gross kind of yellowy ochre already and I'm a little bit of violet and I'm just gonna mix them all together. Remember that your primaries will make all of those really great browns. There's just some little browns in here. And then I'm gonna take my bigger brush and I'm gonna kind of soak the outside of this and set up this really soft background around my gardenia. So I'm gonna use my, um, sorry there. I'm gonna use a flat brush and I've been abusing this flat brush. Um, you should not use your watercolor tools to paint in acrylics. It's not necessarily the best idea, but I will tell you that I have been. And um, I'm just going to make some greens. I'm going to mix up some greens. And I'm going to come in real close. So right now I'm just using water. I'm just like prepping this paper. I'm opening it up. Again, hair washing. I would not put shampoo on dry hair, so I would get my hair wet to begin with so that it would be open and ready to get some soap. And it's the same thing in watercolor. You know, you're gonna wanna get that paper wet and ready to accept, especially if you want some nice flowing colors. Um, so I'm just coming into this edge and I'm making what I call a fence. So I'm basically just getting in close and I'm coming all the way around the edges of my white so that I can just drop this like really amazing green on here and get some high contrast really easily. And then I'm kind of just letting this sort of loose water come through I do not want to get my entire paper in like holy holy wet at this point I want some of those whites to show through in the backs of my leaves as well so that I always have a little bit of white coming through so even if I'm going to do a big wash of color um, I want that I want that white of my paper to come through a little bit no matter what now you're going to have instructors who do not believe in pre-made greens. Why would you spend any money on a pre-made green if you can just so easily make your greens with yellow and blue? So I see a lot of yellow in these leaves. Um, I see a lot of deep greens as well, almost like Kelly greens. I'm gonna start with this kind of like yellowy green and I'm just gonna kind of drop it in here. And I've got quite a bit of pigment and not a whole lot of color, I'm sorry, not a whole lot of water at this moment because I want that water on my paper to sort of do its job and I'm kind of just gonna sneak it in here. So wherever I made that fence with water really close to these petals, now I can come in. Now you can be as structured as you want to with these leaves. This guy's super yellow, so I'm gonna wait on him and bring in, actually, I'll just grab some of that yellow right now because it's going to blend in there so nicely. I went really cold on my yellow. Maybe in your photograph it's like much, much warmer. I'm just going to take some of this yellow up and through here. One of our rules is that we always use a color in more than one place. So if you set a color down on your composition, make sure that it finds itself a home somewhere else. So... I'm just using this yellow right here throughout and then I'm going to drop a little bit more green on here so I'm using a little bit of phthalo green which is already a blue green and then I'm mixing it with a little bit of a warm yellow and getting this really nice kind of like lemony this isn't even lemony this is limey right this is like a good limey green and I'm just gonna set up, I can make some really strong shapes out here. So that's the difference between 
wet paper, right, and dry paper, and right here my dry paper is allowing me to make like actual solid shapes, right, and I can make some leaf shapes coming out this way that are really nice and controlled, but I can come back in here on my wet paper and I can let things be far looser. And the looser that background is, the more controlled your foreground's gonna be. And it's gonna put so much more emphasis on your flower. So if you really wanna force somebody to look at what it is that you're doing in your foreground, I think you can really play with having your background be this sort of loose, not mess, right? But controlled mess. I just picked up a really nice dark green that's got some indigo mixed in with my yellows and I can kind of like tap through here. You can see how this is just gonna flood through. This is a great place in my background to go back to that brown that I used in the center of my uh, little flower to drop in those two little bits. So if I wanna pull some brown for some branches in here and we have some, um, I don't know what to call them, little burnt bits, right, that have either been attacked by the Arizona sun or by a little critter eating them through here. So we can drop a little bit of brown in through our leaves as well. And then we can use some of that brown underneath. And then I'm gonna go, I'm gonna make the executive decision to get some really nice dark blue, like some really good indigo in here. Um, some watercolorists don't believe in using black. Um, I go back and forth depending on the piece. I use so much black in my work at the end. A lot of times I'll bring my black in not as watercolor, but as ink work that I'm adding over the top of my watercolor. Um, and I really think that that dislike and mistrust of the black watercolor comes from the original blacks that were created. Um, so anything that was manufactured initially had lead in it and then after a while it turned um, white, <laughs> which is the last thing that you want is you don't want your darks turning white. Uh, so I think that that's just sort of prevailed for like a hundred years basically. Um, but now our, our ability to manufacture consistent pigments and pigments that really deliver what they say they're going to deliver is just so much greater and I can't even imagine the backlash in a watercolor community if there was a batch of blacks that turned their paintings white. Woo! People would not be happy. So I'm just dripping um, some leaf forms out here, some greens. You can see my greens are just like kind of a mess right now. I have some dark green and some light green all mixed in together. Um, my palette sort of always looks like this. I like never, I never clean it um, because I'm lazy on some level, but also I really do love that every color is mixed from the color before it. And um, it just really helps me see that the last piece I worked on and the color palette that would have, was in the last piece that I worked in, you know, it makes its way into this one. And there's something about that for me as an art maker that makes it as though every piece is just one ongoing piece, you know, and that we're just sort of continuing the practice and, and thinking of it more as a practice. Um, I'm getting in real close on these leaves here on these petals and trying to get them as defined as possible. I may need to change the actual direction. Remembering that your paper can move is really important. And if you're taped down onto a drawing board, remembering that you can move your drawing board um, is something that we forget every now and again. And I taught, you know, high school for almost 14 years and 
that's like one of the biggest reminders that I was always putting out there. Remember that your your paints can move. You know, you can change your situation. You don't have to fight against something that's bringing you frustration. You can, you know, just change it. So I'm going to put a little bit more yellow in this green. Now I've really confused you. I'm sure that I've that I have moved this um and seeing the time here I'm gonna have to do a second video um of the just watercolor approach no pencil um because I think I'm gonna have my little baby girl waking up shortly and as you can see up here there's like there's all this uh beauty and structure in the background over here as well and um, I need to bring in a little bit more definition through here and then I'm really gonna push these darks so here and here oop, boop, here and here and here I'm gonna push some more dark so that my flower comes out even more right so that I really get this sense of it jumping forward um, and then I'm not sure this is dry enough. So this may end up being like a, like a two session thing. I almost always work on my pieces over two different passes. Um, and so I'm gonna come up here and work. This is basically still wet. I've got a little bit of dryness in here. And I think I'm just gonna need more dry over the top of this so if you're at home and you're comfy and working and you can just put your blow dryer on over your piece and make it all dry for yourself again go for it um, I am in a situation at the moment where I am outside and constrained by nap time so I'm probably not going to be getting my blow dryer out here um, but I've just got this kind of lemon yellow situation and let me see with my darks here if I can push this the direction that I want it I'm picking up an indigo which is really one of the darkest blues that you can get and I'm mixing it straight in with some of my greens because then I can just make it even darker. Mixing uh, an already made brown with your indigo is gonna do it too. So maybe I'll take a little bit of like a burnt sienna and mix that in there so they get this really nice dark, dark blue. So if I come in here and drop that in I'm gonna get this really great dark. I think I want a little bit of it over here as well. Remember the more you keep those edges of your flower controlled and you can really pop that background, right? So that you have light pigments next to dark pigments and you're gonna be in a good space and you can take that dark throughout and you can see it's already lightening so much um, and that's one of the things about watercolor is that as it's drying up like that and lifting you know sometimes you lose that drama you lose that impact that you had at the moment that you were dropping the paint down so Occasionally with your darks, you need a second pass no matter what, just to push them back. Um, and I'm gonna put a little bit of blue out on this side, and there's this kind of like this great stem over here. I'm gonna drop some more purple in there as well. I feel like I've really lost the edge of whatever was this petal. I think it dips down in here, and then it comes back over this way. I'm just gonna get rid of this and make this all leaf out here. So this is my indigo mixed in with some 
nice brown, a little bit of burnt sienna, and it's just making this really nice color. I'm just gonna pull this throughout. All right, I can pull this into my leaf here. I've gone back to my sablette. I'm using my point of my brush to make some really nice structure in these leaves. This is gonna dry really nicely and I'm gonna be able to come in with some really solid lines. Like this guy is supposed to be in front of my flower here and he's mostly brown. And I'm just gonna pick up a little bit of red brown, right? A little bit of a warm brown. I'm gonna just drop some little colors right in through here. This needs a little bit more brown. To let that sing here. In through here, coming back up, drop a little bit of brown back in this leaf, drop a little bit of brown over here on this side. Boop, boop, boop. Um, I find that while I'm painting, even if I'm explaining what I'm doing I can really let my mind wander it's like it's like I have two minds right <laughs> one that's focused on the work at hand that's creating this flower and this other one that's just sort of zoning um, and it's the combination of those two parts of my brain that I'm always really seeking that kind of joy of being completely involved and consumed by a task and then at the same time being able to let your mind kind of float um, and you know it's not easy work painting is not easy work drawing is not easy work I love this little bit of brown that I have on my brush so I'm gonna pull a little bit of this warmth this little bit of brown into my flower um, so I have a dry flower here and I, you saw me just put down like the tiniest little bit. I'm just going to take that tiny bit and kind of bring it through. And this is just where I want to add a little bit of warmth in here. You could do this with a light orangish yellow, a little bit of a, a warm brown. Just something that brings that little bit of warmth back into this flower because we want our foreground to have a little bit more warmth than our background, and right now they're kind of fighting because I use so much purple. I'm gonna choose a different color palette, I think, when I go after this the next time. Like, I can see in here, I don't know if it's just looking at this photograph for more time, but there's almost like this yellow singing off of the edges of these in here as well. And maybe I'll go back to that violet and mix a little bit of violet, brown, blue combo and add some kind of harsh lines in there. Oof, should I? I want to. So here's where it is right now. Let me set it up for you so you can see. Yeah, there it is. That's where, it, there's where it is right now. And I'm just going to come in and I'm going to make some more defined lines. So right in here, I'm going to make a nice line and carry that out into the shadow. Right along here, I'm going to make a nice defined line and turn that into the shadow. I just mixed my, my brown that I was using with my violet. And that's allowing me to have a little bit more warmth in here. And this second pass of shadows, you can get so much more depth in your piece. So re remember, we're working out from that center or in towards the center, depending on how you're thinking about it. And maybe you've just found a couple of areas where, like, you really need a line. Like, I really need a line right here to show that that petal 
that's coming forward and that this one turns. And so this is like very much a dry brush over and we're just doing little details. That guy turns there. This one comes around the edge. I'm pushing that shadow so that it's just a little bit darker. Pulling it out into these little, almost like veins, these little striations on the petals themselves. And in here, this is where I added a little bit more warmth. We'll just take a little bit of dark through there as well. And if you feel like it's a little too dark, you can go back in with a little bit of water on your brush and just pull that color back out. Um, I think I want this little bit of structure in here, right? So I want to come in here, add a little bit more, add a little bit more. Just coming out, out from this petal. You get that really great yellow in there. Maybe it, it should be a little bit warmer too. I'm gonna to come back in with a warmer yellow over the top of that. Bringing this around. Just pushing where those core shadows are. What's the darkest point? And really it's almost like a cast shadow from the other petal that's causing that illusion of a core shadow. And moving back out into these guys. Oh, such great structure on these petals. And anywhere you want to force that drama, right? Anywhere you, where you really want to see that this petal is in front of this other, you can come in here and pull that across. And over here, Maybe I just want to pull a little bit in through this way as well. Where else? Right here? Coming in? Maybe right over here? Right in there? Oh, this needs to go darker, that's for sure. And all of a sudden, this reads is like a solid line. I can see it, so I need to soften that guy up. Come out into here. And I'm just taking a little bit of water. And I really believe that one of the rules is no scrubbing. But I also understand that when you're lifting something, you need to agitate those fibers a little bit before you raise them up. And... Maybe you've heard people say that watercolor is one of the most difficult mediums to work in. I just, I think that's so forgiving. You guys saw me just now make that mark and then lift it. And you can do that on a lot of your, you know, work. So if you do find that comfort in the, in the eraser, no worries here. So I'm just pulling a little bit of this dark out, coming into this petal here. Here it's really like so, so solid. I might want to soften that up a little bit. A little bit of water coming through here. A little bit of water coming through here. And now that I feel like you can see, you know, a little bit more of the petal structure, which is what I was feeling like I had lost. And of course, the more and more I look at this flower, the more I want to paint it in different colors. I think I need to look at maybe like doing like a blue and orange combo on this so that these petals are a little bit less yellow and violet and a little bit more blue and orange in their shadows and really pulling that yellow forward as the warmer orange. And then now I have this funny little color on my brush, so I'm gonna drop it into this leaf up here. And ooh, you can see that this is drying. And now I have so much more control. So, um, let's see. I have about five minutes to make this as complete as possible. So let's take a little bit of the green and see what we can do. I'm gonna kind of just use my 
brush here now that I have all this wild background set up and I'm gonna bring my more defined more drawn mark into these leaves so watercolor is to some people drawing and to other people it's very much painting I think it is the perfect bridge between the two mediums because it's so versatile because it can look so many different ways. It can be a wet media, right, where you're really painting with it. And then at other times you can use it very much like a drawing medium. You're working on paper, which is like drawing. You're holding um, a paintbrush as you choke up on the ferrule qu quite a lot like you would use a pencil. Um, especially when I'm just using the very edge, right, the very point of my brush. I'm trying to get just that drawn mark in there. So a lot of times I feel like I'm drawing with my brush. Um, other times I would really feel like I'm making a painting, you know, especially when I'm working wet on wet or I've just set down a big wash. I feel like, oof, that's like, that's very much like painting. But it's so great to have this medium that'll do both things so quickly um, and that you can really jump back and forth between them in a way that I have not found with any other medium. Um, so I think the sooner you think of watercolor as being both a drawing and a painting media, the happier you will be the happier you will be. And uh, here we've got about three minutes for me to finish up here. Bum, 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 bum. And I'm going to want some feedback on what's working and not working in this video because this is the first time that I have done this. And I need a little bit of help understanding what we're looking for in these pieces. I'm pulling a little bit more of like a yellowish green, a little bit of a colder green um, down there in the with the phthalo down here. And then this has got a little bit more warmth in it, hopefully. If I want it to have even more warmth, I can go straight yellow into these guys and drop that in. Oh, I haven't even talked about drop it on. We're never smushing our watercolor. We're just dropping it on. I'm barely ever touching my piece of paper. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just grazing it. Now I'm mixing a little bit more of a deep brown in here. I want to pop that edge and we're going to go straight into ochre. I'm sorry, I said ochre. I don't know why I said that indigo is what I really want, but I'm taking this little bit of brown that I do have and I'm dropping it over here and over here so that in these last few minutes of working on this, I can drop in a nice big leaf shape here. Boom, 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 boom. That's a leaf, right? Sure. That's a leaf. What about a leaf up here? Let's add another leaf up here. A little bit of structure there. Right, come this way. Maybe I'm taking a little bit of my yellow green in here. I've got some really fun combos that happened. This is when I'm like responding to the colors that I laid down and no longer looking at my source material. I feel like there's always a point when I just stop looking at my source material and I start looking at my painting and seeing, you know, what does it need? Where can I respond? Um, a little bit of this green needs to come down in here. And then we're gonna do those blues really quick. So I'm just gonna grab a bunch of indigo on my brush, very little water, what, it's what's called a juicy, like it's got enough water to flow, but it's like a really heavy pigment. And I'm gonna take that blue and I'm gonna lay it down here. So there's that indigo and I'm gonna drop it in. And I'm just gonna pick up 
a little bit of it along here where I can really kind of flank those shadows in. And then I'm gonna take it along the edge over here where I want a darker shadow and I let it run into that blue. I'm gonna take it over here and let it run into, and I'm just kind of making these sort of dappled kind of drawn marks out in the background. And again, I'm just now, I'm responding to where my painting needs this really nice hit of pigment instead of where it is in the actual source material, right? So if I feel like it needs a dark blue somewhere, I get to add it and you get to do the same. And if your piece looks nothing like mine, no big deal, right? You get to figure out where you want your colors to be as well. And now I'm sneaking this blue up into here and it's making this great green, right? As it mixes in with my yellows and all these other colors that are moving on through here. So we'll just take one step back, look at our piece, make sure it's not too controlled and ridiculous. And as I look at it and I see my flower and I see my piece, I'm feeling pretty good about the situation. This feels weird and forced right now, so I'm gonna drop a little bit more brown in there so that it doesn't feel so weird. And then take that little bit of brown, you know, you do it in one place, do it in another place. Take a little bit of brown in here, drop this down into drawn leaves. So over here, just coming down into making some really nice, just drawn marks to finish it up. That little bit of blue and brown just kind of carries us out anything you don't like drop some water on there see what happens remember nothing's precious we're not making these lives with or making these paintings with our lives depending on them we're making ourselves better painters everything's practice uh, we're all just trying to get better at this right maybe you've been doing this for a really long time maybe Today's the first day you were like, oh, I'll give it a try. I love gardenias, you know? So whatever your skill level is, I would love to see what you're coming up with. There's nothing I like more as an art instructor than seeing work that my students have made. Um, and remember that this is just a starting place. So if this turns into a crazy mess, then it turns into a crazy mess and maybe you respond to it in a completely different way than I have and if it's absolutely beautiful and delicate and gorgeous and you did five passes of value on here that's wonderful um I think we all just have Barbara to thank uh, for taking our photograph and using this as our starting place so I think I'm gonna stop right there. Um, this also happens in which I say I'm gonna stop and then I just keep painting because it's so hard to stop once you have started. So we'll call it quits. We'll call it quits there. So here's what I ended up with. And from start to finish while drawing and talking, that took me an hour and three minutes. And down here we have our image, right? And I see now that I just want my flower to glow more. So I'm going to have to work on that. Thanks for listening. And I really appreciate all of you being here. Take care. Bye.